catastrophe. I hear the casualty catastrophes be bantered about, um, which is just emerging issues with latency issues. Um, now there's a term gray rhinos uh, for an issue that's charging right at you and you're still not doing anything about it. I have to give the authors credit for coming up with the terms. They're far more clever than, than I am. But these are all just subsets of emerging issues. Now, we are in the business of paying losses. That's what we are here to do, have no doubt. But we at least hope we are in the business of paying losses that we expected to occur, that we underwrote, underwrote to, that we charged an adequate premium for. The problem is emerging issues result in unexpected losses that we didn't underwrite to and we didn't charge a premium for. And the sad thing is that it, emerging issues will likely cost the industry hundreds of billions of dollars more because again, we don't look forward. Uh, we write business largely on an occurrence basis. So even policies that were underwritten 50 years ago when the underwriter couldn't imagine what is generating the losses 50 years hence, those policies are still can still be hit with loss. Okay, there you go. Now, let me say, I'm gonna zip through some of these slides. As Scott told you, you, you will be getting the slides afterwards. So you'll be able to look at them in more detail. I also should invite you, I post regularly on emerging issues on LinkedIn. So if anybody is interested in attempting to keep up with emerging issues, um, that is one source, uh, please feel free to link in with me. So here's a lot of the issues with emerging issues. They can take decades to develop. Claims can come in for decades. There's usually a large potential, uh, potential plaintiff's pool. They can involve one or multiple defendants, one line of business, one class of business, or multiple lines or classes of business. And the potential for limit stacking over policy years in at least 17 states. So it can get ugly really quickly. The initial emerging issues, uh, asbestos, which I lovingly consider the grandfather of emerging issues, pollution kind of right behind it, mold, lead, these all cost multi-billion dollars. And I say ongoing because the claims keep rolling in. So we've been taking pollution reserves down lately to 47 billion. I think that's a mistake. And uh, we'll talk about that why in a, in a little more, but we do track the costs of these emerging issues, which is good. But there are other emerging issues that I believe has cost the insurance industry more than a billion dollars that we don't track. Sexual abuse and molestation being one, construction defects and faulty workmanship being the other. The industry hasn't tracked those costs. Now, I know that sexual molestation, we have two insurers for the Boy Scouts that together have paid a combined 1.5 billion. So, and that doesn't include the Catholic Church and other entities being sued, schools, other entities being sued over sexual molestation. So I know that's a billion dollar issue. I just don't know if it's a billion nine or nine billion or 40 billion. I have no idea because we don't track it. So let me ask you guys, if, if you understand why we track some billion dollar plus emerging issues, but not others, I'd be very likely to hear your thoughts because it has confused me for 40 years. And there's been a recent growth spurt in billion dollar plus emerging issues. The herbicide glyphosate, opioids, talc, ransomware, we, uh, it definitely has cost the industry over a billion dollars. Pandemic may or may not. Um, I'd be curious if anyone's tracking just defense costs alone well, because the property side of the fence has won at the appellate level most of the business interruption uh, lawsuits that have gone on because of the pandemic. So it would be interesting to know what defense costs have been to date. Uh, but again, I don't think anybody is tracking it. PFAS chemicals. Um, this is a family of 9,000 or so chemicals. Uh, if you think about just the PFAS chemical, <clears throat> excuse me, contamination, that has occurred in states that have not upheld absolute or total pollution exclusions. Uh, and if they're going to be considered under pollution, 
That's why we shouldn't have been taking down reserves for pollution, but there's also going to be product liability in there as well. So these are the, the newest classes of billion dollar plus emerging issues. <clears throat> and there's a couple of others that we're going to go into a little more depth with. Um, violence, which for a long time didn't impact the insurance industry that much, is impacting us to a greater extent. And when I talk about violence, let me make something clear. It doesn't matter to me, and it shouldn't matter to any emerging issues analyst, whether you're on the right side of the political fence, the left side of the political fence, <clears throat> Will this issue impact the insurance industry and, and to what extent? Those are, the those are the thoughts you have to have. It's not whether you own guns, you don't own guns, it has, should have no place in the conversation when you're discussing emerging issues. So again, is violence a billion dollar plus emerging issues? And if it is, does the industry track these losses? Well, to some extent, we do track riot and civil commotion. We can just look at two riots, the LA riots back in 1992 and the two weeks of riots that occurred um, between May and June of 2020. And you can see that those alone have cost about two and a quarter billion. So we know then that violence is a billion dollar plus emerging issue. We do track property damage resulting from riot and civil commotion. And, and those are the numbers you see there, the 775 million and the 1.5 billion. But do we track bodily injury claims, lawsuits that result in claims that come out of riot and civil commotion? I don't believe we do. So mass shootings, well, People don't even agree on a common definition of mass shootings, but given that the Congressional Research Service and an organization called Gun Violence Archives, Archives, excuse me, and several news sources use the definition of four or more shot or killed in a single incident at the same time and location, not including the shooter. So that's what I've adopted as a definition as well. Now, historically, <clears throat> excuse me, insurers have relied on favor liability laws that, you know, there's no, the owner of a business or even an employer is not responsible for the criminal acts of a third party. Kind of makes sense, right? The other thing is they rely on foreseeability. And for a long time, mass shootings were considered so unexpected that they were not considered foreseeable. So this issue of foreseeable became uh, quite important. And for a long time, we didn't have to pay losses for these incidents. And you can look as recently as 2007 in the Virginia Tech mass shooting, which killed 32. And in 2013, the Virginia Supreme Court said the university had no duty to warn or protect the students there from the criminal acts of a third party. So that's as recent as 2013. The question is, are things changing? And by the way, my definition of an emerging issue is new, obviously, or changing exposures. And so is this exposure changing for the insurance industry? Well, let's talk foreseeability. You can see that the curve generally continues to rise. In 2014, a year after that Virginia Tech, there was 269. Last year, 691. almost two a day, 2,402 mass shootings in the past five years. So are they still considered so rare that they will be deemed by courts to be unforeseeable? Well, two courts in Colorado didn't think so. And the first quote there, incidents that were so unlikely to occur in 1984 as to be unforeseeable were not necessarily so by 2012. So that's the question. Are more courts going to start saying that these incidents were indeed foreseeable? And there are other laws that there are other things that are changing that is, that is resulting in these claims hitting the insurance industry. 
Last year, the New York State enacted a law that allows those in the gun liability chain to be sued for creating public nuisance. New York is the first state to do so, but will other states follow? Certainly not all states, but some will. Now, what's happening? Well, now we see that these verdicts and, and settlements are hitting the insurance industry. The 1917 MGM resort shooting, which was the worst mass shooting in the United States, resulted in an $800 million settlement between MGM resorts and the plaintiffs. The insur uh, MGM's insurers and reinsurers are paying 751 million of that 800 million. And that doesn't include three years of defense costs, whatever they were. The Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School shooting in Florida with 17 killed and 17 wounded. Well, the Brow Broward County School District paid a settlement of 26 and a quarter million dollars for that. Families are receiving 127.5 million from the Department of Justice uh, in a suit that was filed against the FBI. There's, I don't believe that the FBI carries liability insurance. I'd be curious if I'm incorrect on that. Sandy Hook Elementary School. The family sued the gun maker of the Bushmaster, which is Remington. And, you know, Congress protected those in the gun liability chain from liability for shootings. However, the plaintiff's attorneys cleverly looked at Connecticut's Unfair Trade Practices Act and argued that the Bushmaster is, Bushmaster is a combat weapon and should never have been marketed to civilians and Remington settled for $73 million. Uh, many states, the majority of states have an Unfair Trade Practices Act. So is this a loophole now that will allow victims and the families of victims to sue the gun makers? I suspect this will result in a patchwork of rulings where some states will allow it, some states won't, but clearly this is another avenue now where they can get money from the insurance industry as well. And it's not just mass shootings. There was a single shooting in a Georgia pharmacy parking lot that in 2012 resulted in a $43 million verdict. And in November of 21, the Georgia appellate court upheld that $43 million verdict, finding that the, sh the shooting was foreseeable. It was not a low crime area. Maybe it was a high crime area. Maybe other crimes have occurred in that parking lot in the past. So these are all things that are changing that are creating liability for those in the gun liability chain. Now, when you talk about, let's go back to talk about the $73 million settlement against Remington, the gun manufacturer. Didn't the distributor or the retailer play a part in getting that combat weapon into the, in, marketed to civilians? Do they advertise? I think some courts would say, yes, they played a part in getting that gun into the hands of civilians. So can we see distributors and retailers also be held liable under this under state's Fair Trade Practices Act? And if you're looking for individual shootings, there's no shortage. Total in the past four years, seven, over 70,000 deaths, over 137,000 wounded. That's a large potential plaintiff's pool. This could result in a lot of litigation, especially as the plaintiff's bar sees the kind of verdicts that are in settlements that are coming down. 751 million, 73 million, 26 and a quarter million. These were all considered uh, nuclear verdicts. And it will certainly drive additional litigation. Workplace violence. It's the fourth leading cause of fatal occupational injuries. Deaths have hovered between four or 500 fairly steadily. 2,282 fatal assaults in the workplace in the past five years. And of course, 93,000 injured in the past five. Now, we do have workers' comp where that's a sole remedy. Okay. But are there third party litigation 
and third party verdicts and settlements being generated by these assaults? Does the insurance industry track those results? We may track the workers' comp results, but do we track any third party litigation results? The answer is I don't think we do. Well, violence, there's a lot of potential defendants. And it impacts multiple lines or multiple lines of business. And now you have specialty coverage, i.e. active shooter. Uh, I would just recommend that you look carefully at those coverages because they vary widely in what they provide and what they exclude. Okay, so we know that we track property claims arising out of riot and civil commotion, but not any bodily injury. Uh, we don't track losses coming out of mass shootings or even individual shootings. And we may or may not be tracking some of workplace violence, but not all. And the question is, do we or should we treat guns just like any other exposure? I would say from an emerging issue standpoint, the answer is yes. How about from an underwriting standpoint? What do you think? I'll tell you an anecdotal story. My former employer, one year, we saw losses. This is on the, the personal line side. We saw two million in losses that we paid out for trampolines. We also saw two million in losses for. No, I can't remember the other one. And but we asked application questions about those exposures. Oh, swimming pools. That was the second one. And we asked on the application. Uh, the, the primary company asked on the application, do you have a trampoline? Do you have a swimming pool? So there were questions on the application to expose those exposures to the insurer and to the reinsurer. We took two million in losses from each of those things that year. We paid 11 million for guns and nobody was asking a single question on their application about gun ownership whether you lock them up, you don't lock them up, whether you, you know, all kinds of risk management, management questions you could ask there. Now that has begun to change. Um, my personal insurer does ask that question. So I, I think that we are beginning to ask that question, but I'm betting at this point that not everybody does. Another potential billion dollar plus emerging issue is e-cigarettes, vaping. Invented in China in 2003, they arrived in the US either the beginning of 2007 or possibly even the, the end of 2006. Uh, up until 2015, the vast majority of e-cigarettes and vaping fluids were made in Southeast Asia. By 2015, an American firm, Juul, dominated the market. And some Juul vaping fluids contain twice as much nicotine as other vaping fluids and nicotine is addictive. So if it contained twice as much, it was pretty addictive. Now, subsequently, single use e-cigarettes, um, one brand called Puff Bar became more popular than Juul, especially among young people. And I can't seem to find out where they're made. Are they made in China? Possibly. There is a large potential plaintiff's pool out there. You can look at the stats yourself. And it goes down to middle school children. And when these are done by surveys and you see where it says 25% or 35% or 20% of middle school children, these are the kids that admit it. There's likely kids who say, no, they've never used it or no, they don't use it when they actually do. So those numbers may actually be higher than what's showing in these surveys. There are acute injuries associated with e-cigarettes. Uh, they do, they can explode. There's a lithium ion battery in there, just like in hoverboards, which explode. And if the battery explodes, they can cause problems, severe burns, broken and lost teeth, broken bones. Uh, one of these suits where it exploded while the person had the puff bar in their mouth and it blew away uh, not only some of their teeth, but some of their jaw. And that case settled for $2 million. So there is real loss exposure for acute injuries. 
And then there's evaling. I call it acute inju injury because it manifested in a matter of one month to three months. These people who were uh, vaping got sick. Now, 87% of those people who got sick, the 68 deaths, the 2,800 hospitalizations, um, some of them were smoking marijuana in their vaping pens, but 13% were only smoking tobacco products. So they're still looking for the cause of what caused this e-valley, but it was quite expensive. There were long hospital stays and many who were sickened had to be hospitalized more than once. And there's a, a 17 year old boy now that he's got the lungs of a 73 year old. What are his lungs gonna be like by the time he's 30 or 35? Um, so it's quite a serious illness. Charlie, pivoting real quick, we just had one question pop in and I'll just, uh -huh. if you wanna ask it or answer it now, or if it's later on in your presentation. Yep. The question yep. is with the recent events in the East in Eastern European and in Eastern Europe, excuse me, would cyber warfare in your in your estimation be considered an emerging issue? Of uh, yes, I mean basically, if you look at cyber, it, there's a lot of potential. I mean, not only is ransomware, as I mentioned, already costing us over a billion dollars, the risk here is actual physical damage and actual bodily injury caused by a cyber attack. Um, having pipelines pipelines explode. Uh, messing with hospitals, shutting down hospitals so life-saving equipment won't work anymore. But yes, um, as a matter of fact, just yesterday, uh, the FBI and the White House, they've all warned that they've, they've given a blanket warning that they expect cyber attacks from Russia and that company should be prepared and should be you know, doing more to protect their systems now. So sure, yes. Now, there's a war exclusion. The question is, you know, we, we've got China and North Korea and Russia, they're all sending cyber attacks against American entities now. Um, does that mean we're at war? Does that invoke the war exclusion? Again, I think we're gonna see a patchwork of rulings across the country on that issue, where some courts, the state say, yes, it's an act of war, even though the U.S. hasn't, quote unquote, declared war on that particular country. Um, so, yes, I do. And I think it's going to be messy. Thank you for the question. OK, so on e-cigarettes, while there are acute injuries um, that result in litigation and some claims dollars, latent Ill illnesses is going to be a much greater concern. Now, I'm going to flip through these slides relatively quickly. Uh, and let me just think of something. Scott, I forgot to set my timer. As I'm about 15 minutes before I have to close, would you please remind me? Yes, yes. certainly. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, so I'm going to flip through these. These are just lists of studies that have shown uh, adverse health effects uh, with the potential for latent illness. And you can look towards the bottom of these slides and you'll see things like lungs, lung scarring, Gee, what else causes lung scarring? Well, lung scarring is called mesothelioma. Initially, it was just asbestos that was believed to have caused mesothelioma. And it's not just asbestos anymore. Long-term lung damage, strong links to bladder cancer, blood vessel damage, heart disease, lung scarring again. De inflammatory bowel disease, dementia, certain cancers. I mean, you can see that they've been associated with very serious illnesses. A single 30 minute vaping session can significantly increase cellular stress. I'll stop here. Uh, some of you may have heard of diacetyl or diacetyl. I've heard it called both ways. This is a synthetic butter flavoring that's actually already cost the industry be between $400 and $600 million of verdict settlements and defense costs. This, uh, you might have heard of this called well, bronchi bronchiolitis obliterans, and it does just what it says. It obliterates your bronchial system. It was also known as popcorn lung, if that makes it uh, more familiar for you. Uh, diacetyl is a synthetic butter flavoring that popcorn workers pour into large vats of butter popcorn and eating it is completely harmless, tastes just like butter. Inhaling it, however, is very harmful. 
Well, it, even though this has resulted in some 300 million in verdicts and settlements plus defense costs, 70% of sweet flavored vaping fluids were found to contain diacetyl. And what do you do with a vaping fluid? You inhale it. So somebody thought that was really clever and that's going to result in quite a bit of litigation at this point. Okay, so are e-cigarettes resulting in litigation? Well, Juul Labs is already facing hundreds of lawsuits by states, municipalities, school districts, school districts. They have filed public nuisance suits. Now, whether that will entail insurance coverage, again, we're likely to see a mixed bag by state as to that. Allegations, because allegations include bodily injuries. It's not, they're not just alleging we've spent a lot of money on this, which is really why public nuisance suits are filed. But it, there's an allegation of bodily injury. So the insurance company may be in at least for defense costs on these public nuisance suits. Jewel sales are plunged by $500 million. Remember now, puff bars are the uh, item of choice. And Jewel has laid off nearly three quarters of its employers. I'm sorry, employees, because of the litigation. So let me compare this. There are other emerging issues that have been out there in the past. And we see retailers, well, no, we see distributors go bankrupt like that. If the manufacturer is in China or overseas, they may not be available to U.S. plaintiffs. They might not be able to get any money out of them. That leaves only the retailer as the only potentially liable party still in the liability chain. So now we can see that already North Carolina has settled their public nuisance suit with Juul. And this is likely the first of many of these such settlements. And that doesn't include individuals suing e-cigarette makers, vaping fluid manufacturers, distributors and retailers for their personal injuries that we were talking about earlier. Potential defendants. Well, again, foreign manufacturers may be out of reach for U.S. plaintiffs, leaving only the U.S. distributors and retailers. Now, ISO, I'm, I'm probably jumping a little ahead of myself here, but ISO already has an exclusion for e-cigarettes. And you may or may not be using it. You may think, well, I don't write e-cigarette manufacturers and I don't write, I don't even write tobacco shops. So I don't need, really need to use it. But these things are sold everywhere. Take a look at the, where they're sold. And this is just, this should not be considered an all-inclusive list. But some of these are probably written on either bot policies or package, commercial package properties. And they could be the last one holding the bag. So it doesn't matter that you don't write vape shops or tobacco shops. Other retailers are likely to get pulled into this litigation and you should be using that. Well, you may want to use that exclusion uh, in a broader sense than you already are. You can see, again, a huge potential plaintiff school. We've already seen our first public nuisance settlement, many not attaching the exclusion to all the policies that they might. And there's potential limit stacking for latent illness and significant verdicts and settlements are likely to come out of this litigation. Charlie, we've got to you know, kind of pivot off of e-cigs before you wind up going into your many more in the wings as far as costs. We've got another question. Um, and if you want to maybe address property coverages and how those pro how property coverages and the policies are responding um, and become responsible for costs associated with acts of violence. Well, again, it, the property uh, folks get hit from from these riots by property damage. Uh, I remember looking after uh, one person's death uh, in 2020 in Minnesota that people were burning facilities down. The fast food chain um, restaurant went up in flames and that's gonna be covered under their property policy. Broken windows, vandalism, looting, 
these are all things that are covered under property policies. And that's the two and a quarter billion that we tracked from the 1992 riots and the 2020, just that two week period. Now, I didn't mention it was on, it is on the slide. So when you see it, you'll know, but you know, in 2020, there were riots before that May to June section. And after June, there were also other riots. So that's not the entire total for the year of 2021. That's just for that two week period, that 1.5 billion. But that's how the property people get hit with riot and civil commotion claims. If I didn't answer that thoroughly enough or you have something else you wanna ask, please just send it to Scott and he'll let me know. All right, so these are some of the other emerging issues facing the property casualty insurance industry. And when I left Genry, we were monitoring well over 200 emerging issues. As I said, never before has there been so many. The speed at which scientific, technological, or, or medical advances have come in uh, is incredible. And we tend to be a very slow moving industry in response to things that we're always looking for the next asbestos. And I don't think that's what we should be looking for. We're looking, so, you know, on the property side, we count how many billion dollar catastrophes there have been. Well, maybe that's what we should look for on the casualty side. How many billion dollar plus emerging issues might hit us? <clears throat> now, one of the toughest things to figure out is timing. And I'm going to jump, to, we, we talked a little bit about public, I'm not going to talk about all these, but I will talk about many of them, uh, time permitting. I'm going to jump to nanomaterials because I started writing, actually, Genry, Swiss Re, and Munich Re all put out publications on nanomaterials in 2004. And they've been around since before 2000. So you have 22 years of policy limits exposed. When's the right time to take action? Is it after a study shows some, something causes, exposure to something causes some sort of cancer? Well, no, because the next one, two or three studies may say that study was incorrect. Okay, that makes sense. Well, what about after 12 studies find that this exposure to this particular thing causes serious adverse health effects? After a dozen studies, is that when we should act? Maybe, maybe not. The problem is we don't act until that first $10 million pop hits our book. And then we've got so many years of potential exposure and limit stacking that we've allowed this mega multi-billion dollar loss to hit us. I gotta say one CEO of a company asked me, what's my competition doing? about this. And at that point, I was near retirement and I was getting tired of hearing that question. And I said, your competition is being stupid, but does that make you feel any better? So with nanomaterials, there have been over 300 studies that have showed exposure to nanomaterials, and that's inhalation, ingestion, and dermal exposure result in significant adverse health effects. And the industry has largely been fairly silent about it. Now, you may feel well, we don't have exposure to that. But that's not true. It's in nanomaterials are in thousands of products used in the construction industry, used all over the place now. You probably have more exposure than you realize. And you'll say, well, I have an absolute or I have a total pollution exclusion on those policies. So I don't need to worry about exposure to a toxin. Well, 16 states have now not upheld absolute pollution exclusions under various fact patterns. Two states haven't upheld total pollution exclusions. Some of these are anything that happens indoors. Absolute pollution exclusion doesn't apply. In, in one state, anything that happens, occupational exposure to a toxin is not excluded. So you probably have more exposure than you think. What have you done about nanomaterials? I'd be curious. Anyway, but nanomaterials, there are now thousands of nanomaterials. 
And we talked about lung scarring and how vaping is causing lung scarring. Lung scarring is mesothelioma. So you, initially it was just asbestos. Well, now carbon nanowires, carbon nanofibers also have been shown to cause lung scarring, also shown to cause mesothelioma. So no longer is it just asbestos. But even though vaping fluid and nanomaterials are causing lung scarring, Many companies aren't doing anything about it. Well, we don't want to turn away all that good business. Well, with these adverse health effects, what in the world makes you think it's going to be good business? Especially on a BOP or a package policy, how much premium are you getting it to have potential limit stacking for 22 years? Autonomous vehicles. This is a huge emerging issue. Now, many of the other emerging issues we talk about cause latent illnesses uh, among a large potential plaintiff's pool. Autonomous vehicles are actually being designed to have less accidents, cause less injury. And yet it's gonna be a huge emerging issue for the property casualty insurance industry. Auto premium makes up nearly half of all the industry's premium. What happens if they're right? 94% of accidents are caused by us. We're tired, we're speeding, we're drunk, we're high, whatever it is. We cause 94% of all accidents. And autonomous vehicles will not be perfect. There will be accidents, but it's gonna be far less. What if it takes away 70 or 80% of accidents? What happens to auto premium? Nosedives, that's half the industry's premium. What are we doing? What are we doing to prepare for that? I don't know. And if you think it's so far in the future, you don't need to worry about it. I got to tell you, it's here already. There are driverless taxis in San Francisco and in Phoenix that have been taking people for a charge, for fares. People are actually paying to take these taxis around the city to various locations in those cities. We've got 18 wheelers that go from California to Pennsylvania and they've been doing it for two years now, and they're autonomous. Now, there's a driver there, just in case something goes wrong in the 18-wheelers, uh, the but it, they've been driving autonomously for over two years now. And there are other examples where tractor trailers are driving autonomously in Texas, in Florida. They're already being used. So if you think this is far in the future, it's not. Now, until there's a if you're thinking until the majority of vehicles are, wire, uh, are autonomous, yes, that's pretty far in the future. But this is already happening. And I wonder, I'd be curious if those underwriters who got the 18 wheel of trucking risks even asked if the trucker was using autonomous vehicles or not. And if the underwriter even knew, knew or knows, I'd be curious. But autonomous vehicles, our autonomous future is coming much more quickly than we realize. Public nuisance litigation is, has become a huge issue. We're using it in opioid litigation. We're using it in e-cigarette litigation. We initially used it against the tobacco industry, which resulted in hundreds of billions of dollars of verdicts and settlements. And now we're expanding the use of that. We may use it against PFAS manu chemical manufacturers in the future. So this is something to watch. And again, there will be state courts that say public nuisance litigation really isn't about bodily injury. So therefore, it's not covered by insurance. But other states where they have made allegations of bodily inju in injury, which we've discussed, may hold the opposite ruling. Probably real so, quick, we've got a, kind of a follow-up question to the property question from before. And I want to just take the opportunity yeah. to remind you that about... 15 minutes to wrap this up, but in, in follow up to the property question, um, there was an interest to learn if there were any new developments within the industry with property policies being called upon in cases such as the MGM case or Stoneman Douglas or Sandy Hook, workplace violence, anything of that nature um, with property or liability for that matter. Well, they're not being pulled in for liability. They're not being pulled in for bodily injuries. Property coverage does not cover bodily injury. Um, so no, if that's what you're thinking about. 
I mean, even in the Las Vegas shooting, okay, the guy broke the hotel window so he can shoot out the window. I'm sure that that broken window fell within MGM's retention. Um, so there's got to be actual physical property damage for the riot and civil commotion to be covered under the property policy. And that's what they're trying to get with the whole uh, COVID-19 thing. Does the existence of COVID-19, the virus is on surfaces. Is that property damage? And so far, uh, appellate courts have said no, um, because it wasn't physically demonstrably damaged. So unless that's the only way that property is gonna get pulled into those property coverage is gonna get pulled into those. Unless there's some clever plaintiff's attorney thinking about something that I have yet to think about and that they are very clever. They've taken our industry for a lot of money by being very clever. That's the best I got for you, I'm afraid. Oh, that's, and again, you got about 15 or so minutes. Okay, good. Uh, cyber attacks we talked about a little bit and I'm mostly concerned with the cyber attacks that cause BI or PD, either shutting down hospital equipment, blowing up pipelines, um, all kinds of things that they can do, causing massive leaks of some toxic chemical, causing an anhydrous ammonia explosion or whatever. Um, those are the cyber attacks that most concern me um, because we cover BI and PD, third-party PD, under our general liability commercial umbrella policies. You'll also have property damage coverage. Obviously, if there's an explosion or something, there'll be a property damage element to that as well, first party property damage. But we are, you know, we've, we've come up with all these cyber coverages. Uh, I don't think we have a firm grasp exactly on what we're doing. I think the bad guys seem always to be two or three or four steps ahead of the good guys. Uh, and that's a recipe for rising. You, you, now, you know now this year that cyber, the cost of ransomware coverage and other cyber coverage has gone up considerably because we're trying to play catch up. So concussions and traumatic brain injury, if you write schools or athletic programs, um, I think this is going to be a bigger issue. We're also seeing uh, allegations of traumatic brain injury being stated now in auto claims and things like that. But that has the potential to be very large, especially if you're writing in a jurisdiction where schools can be sued. In some states, they can't be. They, they have governmental immunity. In other states, they can be. Um, so it depends on where you're writing business and what the, the laws are of that state. Abrogation of apologies, defenses. We've already talked about this a little bit in that the pollution exclusion has not been upheld in 16 jurisdictions. Uh, under a variety of different fact patterns. And yet most people still write policies without giving any pollution exposure a second thought because we've got this absolute or total pollution exclusion. Um, that might not be the best. As a matter of fact, just this past week, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals have, has had ruled that the employer's liability exclusion is ambiguous. So do you have someone tracking these types of dis these coverage actions and these decisions because it can open up your policies to quite a bit of loss. Marijuana, a lot of people are interested in, in starting to cover marijuana businesses. It's, it's viewed as a new money-making uh, thing for the insurance industry, but you have to understand the potential for latent illness. You're writing it on an occurrence basis and there had they never studied marijuana, the adverse health effects of marijuana before, because guess what? It was illegal. Now that it's legal, there's probably a dozen studies already showing adverse health effects. So you need to be aware, especially if you're considering offering liability coverage to them, that there is the potential for latent illness. Microplastics, another area where there might be public nuisance litigation filed over it, but Microplastics, and not only microplastics, but nanoplastics. When microplastics break down into small enough particles, they become nanoplastics. Um, it is in the rain, it is in the snow, it is in the soil. Microplastics and nanoplastics are everywhere. We eat about a credit card's worth of plastic a week. And you know what they say, you are what you eat. 
So I expect that this is going to result, this could result in natural resource damages, litigation, pollution, uh, product liability. There can be a lot of different uh, lawsuits filed against the manufacturers of, of plastics. Climate change. Uh, I stopped talking about this for a while because it was so controversial. I no longer, it may still be controversial in the minds of some, but uh, we are already undergoing climate change. We have a longer wildfire season than we've had. We have more virulent wildfires than we've had. Um, look at what happened with the storm that, that flooded New Jersey and New York, where people drowned in basement apartments and the property damage associated with them. So hurricanes are getting, the, they may not be getting stronger, they're getting wetter, causing more damage. But climate change is going to result in more and more losses. And it's something we need to think about. There's something called attribution science now, where dozens of scientists are actively working to say this company, that company, this industry, the oil and gas industry, for instance, is responsible for climate change and we have the proof. So while we sit back and the insurance industry sits back and says, you know, we don't really have any losses, so I'm not going to worry about chasing away this good business. You've got dozens of scientists who are actively trying to get that liability chain in place. And we ignore that at our own, at our own risk. Internet defamation. How many kids are on the internet calling little Janie or little Bobby or their teachers some sort of defamatory name, comment? And there's real lost dollars associated with this. I posted on LinkedIn just a couple of weeks ago a $50 million verdict for internet defamation. Now, I expect the bulk of that to go unpaid, but if you're a high-end homeowner, you may have coverage, uh, personal injury coverage under your homeowner's policy. Uh, you certainly have it in your personal umbrella. If you have a personal umbrella, now only about 10% of insureds have a personal umbrella, but even if you have a $2 million personal umbrella, obviously, unless that person is extraordinarily wealthy, that 50 million is going to largely go unpaid, but there is real lost dollars. There's already been over a billion dollars paid out for internet defamation and internet defamation can be covered under personal injury under the personalized side, but also under general liability and commercial umbrella policies. Epigenetics, what is bodily injury? They are finding injury at the cellular level and it's passed down through generations. Lead, certain pesticides, they're causing changes to your cells that shouldn't be there. Is that bodily injury? Are we gonna have two or three or four new generations of people suing the same people who gave uh, their, par their parents or great grandparents asbestos? Because they, so what is bodily injury? If something is adversely affecting your cells, even though you feel fine right now, is that bodily injury? I don't know. The fourth industrial revolution, interconnectivity, autonomous vehicles, robotic use is, is increasing dramatically. Because guess what? You don't have to give a robot benefits. You don't have to pay them vacation time. They're never sick. They're never absent. Uh, and more and more robots are showing up in the warehouse industry, in the fast food industry. And you're going to see more and more of that. And it's going to change. There's going to be far fewer workers employed. There was a, there's a warehouse in China, a huge warehouse that employed hundreds of people. It now employs six people and not all at once. And they're there to make sure the robots keep running. So they are trained in robotics. They, they have a degree in robotics. What does that do to all the high school grads or people who don't even have a high school diploma who are working in the warehouse? Uh, it's also becoming prevalent in the farming industry, robotics. So this changes the exposure. What kind of injuries are, there's gonna be less injuries, but maybe they're gonna be more severe. Are we looking at it? Do we know, do we ask on applications? 
pesticides and herbicides. Well, you know, we got glyphosate, which is Roundup, which is going to cost billions in settlements. You've got a pesticide called Paraquat, which is already uh, lit class action and individual suits alleging that exposure to Paraquat caused their Parkinson's disease. You, you got Dicamba, which has already resulted in $400 million of verdicts and settlements uh, because the, the weed killer kills crops, neighboring crops. And you've got dozens of other pesticides, atrazine, which is the most widely used one. What we need to understand about pesticides and herbicides is they're designed to kill something. So I doubt that exposure to them are very good for us either. Um, here's one, airborne liquid crystal monomers. I'm talking to you on my laptop. You're all listening on a laptop, an iPad, an iPhone, a tablet, whatever. And a TV, anywhere there's a screen, there are liquid crystal monomers that make up that screen. And apparently they become airborne, they shed. And they've, there's been a study done where they've checked offices, homes, hotel rooms, and there are liquid airborne crystal monomers in the air. We are breathing them in, we are ingesting them and they are gathering in our bodies. Are they small enough to pass through the blood barrier, uh, brain blood barrier? Are they gathering in our lungs? You know, something artificial, something made by man now gathering in your body, it's just not a good thing. And how many of us are exposed to screens? Everybody just about, very few people are not exposed to screens. So where is this gonna go? The other thing are deep fakes. You probably all heard of these. Uh, there's a deep fake out there that has President, former President Obama saying something tawdry and it looks just like him and it sounds just like him. And you now have had, in speaking of the war in Ukraine, someone brought up a question about Eastern Europe. They had a deep fake of President uh, Zelensky calling, telling his troops to surrender to the Russians. But it wasn't President Zelensky, it was a deep fake. But there he was on screen saying the words in his voice, is this gonna to contribute to the whole defamation and disparagement thing? Are we gonna have people saying bad things about other people and thus we're gonna get hit with more internet defamation? So, so where else, where, where is that gonna go? Voco, by the way, is something that it doesn't use an image but it uses someone's sound. So it could say, uh, Charlie King Dollar made a phone call and this is what he said, we taped it and it's Voco. I never really said it, but it sounds exactly like me. And these deep fakes are getting harder and harder to tell apart from reality, even for technical experts. So where's that gonna go? So I'm about out of time. These are just some of the couple of hundred emerging issues that we're facing. My goal was to try and convince you and the, anyone in the insurance industry that we have to look forward, not just backwards. And it takes time. It takes research. Yes, uh, is paying someone a salary worth it? In my mind, absolutely. I did it for almost 39, uh, over 39 years. Um, and you may think, well, that's one more person. And, you know, we're all trying to trim people and trim costs and everything else. But not to have somebody monitoring all these emerging issues, hitting all, hitting both property and casually and multiple lines of business and multiple classes. You're being, in my opinion, penny wise and pound foolish if you don't have people watching. And I got to tell you, some people, some large insurance companies, they have a committee of people. But those people only are supposed to spend 10% or 15% each. Well, they're not really judged by that in their evaluation. If they're a claims person, if they're an attorney, if they're a, a casually underwriting manager, they're judged by their primary job as far as whether they're going to get an increase or a bonus or a promotion. And while they're assigned to do it 10% of their time, maybe they only really do it 2% of their time. Not the best way, in my opinion, to do it but you have to have people looking forward. I hope I've convinced you of that. Uh, if I have a couple of minutes left, I'll open it up for questions.
Anything, Scott? Okay, well, if there are no questions, uh, I thank you for your time. I hope you found it interesting. Again, feel free to follow me on LinkedIn. I post about emerging issues uh, rather frequently, I guess. And thank you, Scott, for the invitation. Hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay, good. Uh, my computer went bad. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, it must I must be having some problems with uh, with uh, with monomers or something? I don't know. <laughs> you know, Charlie, we're getting a lot of comments here that everybody's finding this very interesting. I can tell you that without fail, every time I listen to you talk on this issue for about a week, I don't sleep well. So thank <laughs> well, you for that. I appreciate that. I didn't want to go to sleep anyways. Well, um, let, me, let me make one point then, because you're right, I get that a lot. But my job is to not, I, when I worked for Genry, I was in the reinsurance business. Our job was not to stop you from writing business because that wouldn't help us at all. But again, we're trying to write profitable business business where we understand the exposure and charge an adequate rate for the exposure. If our competition is undercutting us by 50% because they don't understand the exposure, let them have it. It's not gonna be profitable. Why are you fighting over that? Anyway, so that's yeah, it. No, and, and you're right, with a $250 bot policy, it's certainly, yeah, exactly. certainly not worth it. It's probably a, a good opportunity for me to just say, maybe this is an industry where we all have to be comfortable we all have to be comfortable with the idea of feeling uncomfortable for the majority of our of our time in the industry. At any rate, um, as I said prior, I will be emailing out to everybody a copy of the presentation. We're also recording the presentation, so I'm hoping to make that available to you as well. Um, if there's any questions on this presentation or any other presentation, reach out to your company representative um, or anybody on the board. We had, by my count, approximately 95 to 100 people on this call um, from people in the room and then people just on the phone. So the hybrid, these hybrid meetings that um, the Central Illinois chapter is doing and continues to do and provide education seem to be working. We appreciate your attendance today. And uh, with that, I'll say thank you and uh, have a good afternoon and a great rest of your week. Bye-bye now. Thank you again. Thank <laughs> you.